Hey everyone, I'm Demon Master of Medics. Thanks for checking out today's case. Uh, I hope you had a chance to check out the case beforehand and think about it, uh, but if not, no worries. We'll go over everything now. So, you and your partner um, got sent to a private residence for a male party with chest pain. You pull up on scene, and you find this guy with severe chest pain. Uh, he's 70 years old. Uh, he describes the pain as kind of sudden onset, uh, and says that it started about 20 minutes ago. And that he states the pain is like, you know, a tearing that moves into his back. So his physical exam um, is unremarkable, and your partner obtains kind of the following vitals. So you have a heart rate of 110, a blood pressure of 164 over 86, respiratory rate of 22, and SpO2 of 96%, and then his temp and glucose are both normal. So, uh, as you say, you cut up and uh, you do one, and it just shows a sinus attack at 110. There's no semi or signs of acute ischemia. So, let's pause here and think about the differential diagnosis for chest pain. So, the differential for here uh, for chest pain is pretty broad, right? I mean, in just the U.S. alone, 7.5 million people present to the ED every year for chest pain. Um, this makes it the second most popular complaint for ED visits in the U.S. Um, and that's because, at least in part, there's approximately 1 million causes of chest pain, right? Um, you know, chest pain is a disease. It's a symptom, and it's a symptom of a lot of different disorders. Some life-threatening, others not. And really, our job in EMS is to figure out what is and really focus on ruling out the life-threatening causes. And really, there are six really important, immediately life-threatening causes of chest pain that we always need to think about. Uh, and there's actually a good acronym to remember them by, fortunately, and that's PETMAC. Um, and, you know, the PETMAC causes of chest pain are the ones we can't miss and should always kind of be in our differentials. So PETMAC stands for pulmonary embolism, esophageal rupture, tension pneumothorax, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, and cardiac tamponade. Um, you can't miss these things. You need to consider, you know, each of these every time you encounter a chest pain patient. And from there, we need to kind of rule in or rule out each one using a history, physical exam, different diagnostic tests, etc. cetera. Um, now, I kind of, you know, set you guys up for the slab dunk with a traditional presentation of a disease process today. And this guy, this patient here today is having an aortic dissection, right? Um, so the traditional teaching, right, is a you know, sudden, severe, tearing or ripping chest pain that radiates to his back with hypertension and a normal ECG, um, which is almost exactly how this person presented. The problem is that this isn't the case most of the time. So if you actually look at the data, 96% of patients describe some type of pain, right? Um, makes sense. 91% say it's either severe or the worst pain they've ever experienced in their life. 87% uh, basically say it came on suddenly. Uh, but only 76% say the pain is in their chest. Sometimes it's back, sometimes it's belly. You know, it could be in other places. Uh, only 64% of patients describe the pain as being sharp. 54%, so only about half, get pain in their back at all. Uh, and again, only about half say the pain is tearing or ripping. So don't worry about the murmur thing. We're not going to go over that. Um, here's something interesting. Only 28% of patients have pulse deficits between their arms. This is a big thing for me. Notice I didn't mention anything about bilateral blood pressures during this case. Only 28% of confirmed aortic dissections have a pulse deficit. Never mind a blood pressure difference between the arms. So, to be diagnostic irrelevant, the blood pressure difference has to be greater than 20 millimeters of mercury between the two arms. So the jam is that 50% of the population has a natural difference of 10 millimeters of mercury between each arm. Uh, and almost 20% of the population has a difference of greater than 20 at baseline, just sitting here every day. That's almost one fifth of adults, you know, So almost one fifth of people, you know, have this at baseline. This is not sensitive or specific for aortic dissection. Uh, however, to be fair, if it presents it can increase the likelihood of it being an aortic dissection if you already suspect one. You just can't hang your hat on it, and this isn't the smoking gun silver bullet that we think it is, right? It, it can help aid our diagnosis, but this is by no means the diagnosis. So for me, I cast a wide net. Aortic dissection is 
always on my differential, and it's always something I consider. And that's really the best way to not miss aortic dissections, right? Um, this is unfortunately, even in ERs, one of the things that's oftentimes missed at first uh, and kind of caught on the CT or whatever afterwards. Um, and, it, and we need to kind of be better at it, right? And so does just medicine in general. Uh, the best way to find an aortic dissection is to always think about an aortic dissection. So always have it on your mind. Some other things you can look for are focal neuro deficits. Um, they're only you know present in around 10% of dissections, uh, but they're 95% specific for the condition when described with chest or back pain. So it's that like chest pain plus one, right? Uh, some of you may have heard of that before. So basically if the patient has chest pain and random leg numbness, or chest pain and foot numbness, or chest pain and you know arm weakness, chest pain and stroke-like symptoms. These are uh, it's that chest pain plus one that we can start to think about dissection as a presentation, uh, and they can also present as an inferior STEMI. Um, they can present in cardiac tamponade, and both of these are from retrograde rupture into the um, the STEMI is from retrograde dissection into the um, right coronary artery, and then the tamponade is from a retrograde rupture into the pericardium. Uh, you can, can present with hypotension. They can have a history of hypertension, a history of uh, atherosclerosis, and, and there are more, but these are the big ones. So with all that stuff out of the way, let's talk about aortic dissections. So a dissection is a separation. Aortic refers to the aorta, right? So basically an aortic dissection is a forceful separation of the walls of the aorta. And this is different from an aneurysm, which is an enlargement or ballooning of the aorta due to a weakening. Dissections and aneurysms are not the same thing, and the terms are not interchangeable. So, both are aortic syndromes. Both are at risk of rupture. Both can occur anywhere along the aorta, and both can actually happen together, but they are not the same thing. And this is like a wicked pet peeve of mine. Uh, a dissection is always an emergency, right? It's got an estimated mortality rate of 15 to 30% in the first 24 hours. Um, or basically it increases 1% to 2% per hour, uh, or 10 to 20% in the next 24 hours. Um, it's almost always symptomatic. Uh, there's a force, there's this forceful separation that can expand with basically every beat of the heart. Um, you know, there's this internal tear and blood's getting into it, and it's creating this false track along the aorta. Uh, an aneurysm, on the other hand, is usually a coincidental finding. So it's usually like the patient comes in for whatever else, they get a CT, uh, and they happen to be like, oh, by the way, you have an aneurysm, right? Most people have no idea they have it. Lots of people live with them every day, and it's not an emergency unless it's leaking or ruptured. So it's usually not even treated unless it's greater than five to six centimeters. Usually they just watch it. Most people don't need it treated at any point in their life. So you know, it's similar in that they both involve the aorta, but it's different in that they are not interchangeable terms. A dissection is an emergency. An aneurysm sometimes is an emergency, but usually isn't. And I feel like we we tend to say aneurysm when we mean dissection oftentimes. Um, so with that out of the way, we'll talk uh, more about dissections in a minute. First, I want to go over the anatomy of the aorta real quick. So here we have the aorta, its largest vessel in the body. It feeds the entire body with dozens of vessels coming off of it. And it comes off of the left ventricle. It arches and then descends down through the level of uh, L4, which is roughly where your uh, umbilicus sits. And then it splits there into the iliac arteries. Here's kind of a simplified picture of it. For our purposes, it has three main parts here. So we have the ascending aorta, the arch, and the descending aorta. So in the ascending aorta, this includes the aortic root and the aortic valve, uh, the right and left coronary ostia, which is the coronary sinuses of the aortic root. So basically these are where the uh, coronary blood vessels come off of that's attached to the base part of the aorta. Uh, and then it moves anterior towards the back in the arch. So the arch isn't like up and over, it's back and behind. Next, we have the arch, which is that like bending part, right? There's three major blood vessels that come off of that. The first that you come, if you come off of the heart, the first one you meet is the brachiocephalic artery. And that's uh, eventually splits uh, and feeds the right side of the head and the right arm. So it first splits into the right subclavian and then it splits into the uh, right common carotid artery. 
Next, if you go past the brachiocephalic artery, that first vessel there, you find the left common carotid artery, which feeds the left side of the head. And then that third vessel there is the left subclavian, which feeds the left arm. Um, the aortic arch ends at what's called the isthmus, which is marked by the ligamentum arteriosum. Uh, and basically, the aorta is relatively fixed to the thoracic cage in this region. And that basically sits right at the end of the left subclavian. So that, that third vessel you see there, um, kind of like a centimeter away from that is where uh, the isthmus is. So uh, the descending aorta is split by the aortic hiatus at the diaphragm. Um, so basically, you have your descending aorta, your thoracic descending aorta, and then your abdominal descending aorta. Uh, and it splits at where the um, aortis goes through the diaphragm. Um, this begins at the isthmus and then goes down until it reaches the iliacs. There's two main sections, again, the thoracic, which goes from T12, uh, T4 to T12. Uh, and then there's several major arteries that come off of that. You have like your brachial arteries, your mediastinal arteries, your esophageal arteries, your uh, pericardial arteries, um, your superficial phrenic arteries, your intercostals, your subcostal arteries, and you have nine pairs of each of those. There's lots of stuff that comes off of that. And then your abdominal, you have, you know, a couple major arteries come off of that too. The big ones would be the renal, splenic, and mesenteric arteries that you'd have to worry about. Um, so there's lots of stuff that comes off of the descending aorta. And if we look here, we see a more kind of realistic picture of all of this. And there it is coming off of the heart. If we look at a cross-sectional view, uh, you have different layers of the aorta. If you go from um, inside to outside, the inside is the intima layer, and that's the internal lining, and that's the part that's really easily damaged. Then you have the media, which is the most uh, mostly elastic tissue layers and kind of smooth muscle. And then the adventitia, which is that thin outer layer, and that's what actually like anchors the aorta within the body. So with that stuff out of the way, let's talk about dissections. So because depending on where the tear is and depending on where the dissection goes, you can have different signs and symptoms, you have all of these vessels coming off the aorta at different places, right? Uh, so you may or may not get cut off uh, or blocked uh, depending on where the aorta tracks. So can you describe the pathophysiology behind aortic dissection? So this results from a tear in the intimal layer that allows passage of blood into the media, right? That middle chamber there. Um, and that creates this false channel or false lumen. Uh, and this usually occurs due to a weakened portion of the aortic wall. Um, the area most susceptible to shear forces produced by positive blood flow through the aorta uh, tends to be the areas where the dissections start. We'll go over those in a second. Uh, and it frequently happens in that like greatest area of shear forces. That's usually where they happen, then they propagate down from there. So around 60... Uh, more than 60, around 61, 62% of tears start in the ascending aorta. This is by far the most common location. More specifically, you have the right lateral wall, uh, and that is um, right before you get your brachiocephalic artery. Um, and that's due to this repeated force of ejection from the ventricle itself, and it creates this weak spot, especially in the presence of hypertension. Uh, around 24% start in the descending aorta. Uh, most happen in the aortic isthmus, which is uh, the area just to the right of that subclavian artery again, about a centimeter down. Um, and, um, you know, that's the that third one off the arch there. Anyway, uh, and then 3% happen within the abdominal aorta. And then finally, around 9% happen in the aortic arch. So 1% to 2% happen in some other random location. Um, you know, basically these things can happen really anywhere along the aorta. It just happens to be the ascending aorta the majority of the time. So notice like everything starts in or begins in or whatever, right? Um, because the tear starts there, and then with each contraction, that dissected channel extends. So you get propagation, and that propagation depends on the blood pressure and the steepness of the pulse wave, something called delta P over delta T, or the rate and change of you know, pressure over time. We'll go over that in a second when we go over treatment. Basically, high heart rate and hypertension enhance that you know migration of the dissection down, and that can be either uh, proximally or distally. So it can dissect backwards into the heart or down into the lower parts of the aorta. Um, and that's where you get this potential for like branch artery compromise or rupture, right? So like if I have this vessel, like the, we'll say the renals that come off of the aorta, if I have this dissection tract that intersects that, we get this flap that blocks off, you know, 
blood flow to whatever that's feeding. And in the case of the renals, it's the kidney, right? So you can get this dissection that cuts off the kidney, right? And it can do that anywhere along its track. Um, the big consequences for a dissection is the big one's a false lumen. Um, and that false lumen may have little or no outflow, right? So there's this increased pressure relative to the true lumen. Uh, and then you can get compression uh, or, you know, potentially compromised downstream blood flow because of that. So basically, um, you've now split the aorta in two parts. You have this false tract that's created from the tear and the normal main aorta. And you can get blood preferential entering that false tract. And that actually, one, puts you at risk for rupture because that starts to expand and it cuts off the actual aortic tract that you want the blood to go down. Um, see, that's this false Lewin problem. And you can also get the intimal flap, which is the obstruction of the vessels I was just talking about. And that can end in this multiple types of end organ male perfusion, depending on where it is. So when we talk about dissections, we talk about them in uh, classifications, right? So in these classifications are according to location. So you can have ascending or descending, um, you know, dissections. Um, these proximal or ascending dissections um, tend to be more common, and they're actually the more lethal of the two. So we have two major systems of classification. Really, there's three, um, but I'll talk about the third one soon. Um, DeBakey and Stanford are the two most popular ways to talk about it. There's recently a third way that like just the vascular people talk about, um, but you're going to hear it in emergency medicine is one of these two ways. Um, DeBakey is split into, um, type one, type two, type three, um, and it could be like type three, a type three B, um, dissections and then Stanford is type A or type B. So if we look at DeBakey and they're both in this picture here, DeBakey type one is the ascending aorta and then part of the distal aorta. Uh, and this is the most common type. And then you have type two, which is the ascending aorta only. And then you have type three, which is the descending aorta only. Uh, and then you can have these subtypes. So subtype A uh, is the extensions limited to above the diaphragm. And then subtype B, it goes below the diaphragm into the abdominal aorta. In, at least where I'm from, no one really talks about it in the context of DeBakey definitions. Uh, it's almost always Stanford. This is just what I'm used to is Stanford. So Stanford type A is the ascending aorta. Uh, and then Stanford type B is not the ascending aorta. And what do I mean by that? Type A dissections, if anything... If any part of the dissection involves that ascending part, it's a type A dissection. Even if it goes from that ascending part all the way down to the iliacs, it's a type A dissection. To be a type B dissection, uh, it can't involve the ascending aorta. So basically a type A is ascending or ascending plus descending. A type B is just descending. Um, and this is... Stanford, in my again, in my experience, is by far the most common way to talk about these. Um, so it's what I'm used to. Uh, there's this newer classification that I mentioned used by the vascular and thoracic folk, um, where the aorta is basically split up into multiple small sections between different major branches and offshoots. Um, but you're not really going to hear about those for the most part. So uh, complications, right? So we can have tamponade, hemopericardium, uh, and this is the most common cause of death by aortic dissection. So usually when they rupture, we picture aortic dissection rupturing and like filling the belly full of blood and stuff like that. That's usually not the case. What usually happens, especially with the ascending type, is they rupture and then fall backwards into the pericardium. So you get, uh, they, they die of pericardial tamponade. Um, you can get aortic regurgitation, you can get uh, myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, um, branch artery compromise, and, and the branch artery compromise can involve the brachiocephalic vessels. So you can get things like syncope, stroke, blood pressure difference, that's the blood pressure difference come from, pulse difference, uh, paraplegia, intercostal um, vessels, you know, perfusing the spinal cord can be messed up, you can get mesenteric vessels that are involved, renal vessels, compromising blood flow to the bowel, kidneys, the iliofemoral vessels, um, it can be literally anywhere. And all of this is why the presentation of aortic dissection can vary so widely. And that's why that like chest pain plus one, it's because of things like this. So how do we diagnose aortic dissection? You really don't, right? Well, aortic dissection also often presents with clinical signs and symptoms. Ultimately, you need imaging to truly diagnose it or rule it out. So it's one of those things we can suspect, but we can't actually diagnose. Um, and when we talk about imaging, 
CT scan is usually the gold standard, right? You can you can see it in a chest X-ray sometimes, where you'll get this widened mediastinum or this irregularity of the aortic contour, um, and it. But that those things can be normal in thirty percent of patients, so it's not super specific. CT scan with contrast is the gold standard, right? Ninety plus percent sensitivity and specificity in identifying an interval flap and differential flow and true versus false lumens and CT scan is what you want to see. Uh, and this picture that you see there is from a CT scan. Um, MRI is the most sensitive and specific, um, obviously, but it's just, it's not practical to get in an emergency. So CT scan is considered the gold standard. Um, so what we do is suspect and transport appropriately, and then the hospital will get a CT. <coughs> uh, but we should also do an EKG to rule out other causes, uh, because the ECG in an AR section is normal 41% of the time. So it means it's abnormal most of the time, right? So you can get ST changes around 41% of the time. You can get left ventricular hypertrophy around 26% of the time. Then you can have signs and symptoms of random ischemia around 15% of the time. Uh, and this may, most of the ischemia and the STEMI problems are due to retrograde extension of the dissection into the right coronary artery, right? So you can get ST elevation 8% of the time. It's usually, if you're going to have ST elevation 75% of the time, it's going to be inferior changes. And then you can look at your high laterals also. So what is the treatment? Again, nothing specific for us to do here except transport to an appropriate facility, um, but which is what we did, right? Um, so at the bedside, we assessed the patient. We did some vitals. We got him in a stair chair. We moved into the stretcher. In the ambulance, we did an IV, did the monitor, uh, ECG, and in route, we gave fentanyl. And fentanyl is actually really important here. And I'll get to that. So upon arrival to the ER, the patient was turned over to the team, and his CT showed a very large dissection. Uh, specifically, he had a Stanford type A dissection, or uh, DeBakey type 1. Um, so that's the one that goes from the ascending aorta all the way down, um, the one highlighted here. And basically, it went from his ascending aorta all the way down to his renal arteries, and that's where it stopped. So when it comes to dissection, um, this matters, right? Um, where the aorta is and what type of um, dissection it is matters for treatment. Um, you know, not only from a management perspective, but the surgical team, you know, depending on where you work, may or may not even be able to treat this type of patient, or the surgical team would be different depending on what type it is. So like vascular surgery versus thoracic surgery could be doing this type of case. And if it's just a descending aorta, it's usually vascular surgery. If it's an ascending aorta, oftentimes the thoracics are involved. So like knowing the ability, the capabilities of your hospitals and where the patient should go if you expect a dissection is a really important thing. So generally speaking, type A dissections get surgery, right? They're almost always fatal without it. Type B, it depends. If it's an uncomplicated dissection or a dissection that tamponades itself, um, they can be medically managed. Uh, if it's a complicated, um, they're going to get uh, in some form of intervention, whether that be endovascular or surgical. Um, things like persistent pain, uncontrolled hypertension, expansion, rupture, further vascular compromise, those types of things will require some form of intervention. Um, the reason they try not to intervene on type B is you have lots of vessels that come off of type B. And fixing all of those and trying to put all those back together is very, very, very challenging. Whereas a type A, you really have three things to fix. And in type A, they're at such a high risk of tamponade and stuff like that. You, you have to fix them. So for medical management, regardless of the type, at least at first, um, so like in the ER, right? Medical management for the ER, the first step is analgesia. Always. These things hurt very badly. Give these patients pain meds uh, and make the patient more comfortable. Now, this is beneficial and really beneficial, not only because of the sensation of pain, like you should always treat your patient's pain, but also their overall treatment. Because the next step is something called anti-impulse therapy. And the biggest thing with dissections is controlling something called the delta P delta T, right? Or the change in pressure over the change in time. And basically the progression and motility of the dissection is proportional to the flow and pressure that the dissection is experiencing. So basically with every strike against that tear, more and more blood gets in, and the bigger the tear gets, the worse the dissection is. So the goal in anti-impulse therapy is therefore to, one, decrease the number of times that impulse happens. So if we slow that heart rate down, it doesn't hit it as much. And then to decrease um, the strength of those strikes, to so decrease blood pressure. So every time it does hit it, 
it's weaker. And that's, that's what anti-impulse therapy is. So we do this by decreasing the heart rate and decreasing the contractility and blood pressure. Uh, generally, you shoot for a heart rate of less than 60 and a blood pressure of less than 120, um, sometimes more aggressively, a blood pressure of less than 100. So how do we do this? The first step, we already did, right? The first step is controlling pain here. Uh, because turns out you can give someone lots and lots of Esmolol, Nicard, and all these other things. If they're in pain, their heart rate's going to stay high and their blood pressure is going to stay high. So we need to control their pain first, right? Because that raises heart rate and blood pressure. Fix the pain. Fentanyl is a great option because it's not only an analgesic, but it's a sympathetic also. Um, so go heavy handed with the fentanyl. And then next we need to drop their heart rate. So something like Esmolol is great for this. Esmolol is a beta blocker infusion. Uh, it's fast on, fast off, titratable. Um, but there are other options like labetalol, et cetera. Uh, both will lower the heart rate to kind of a lesser extent, the contractility. Um, but yeah, Esmolol is a great option. Labetalol too. Um, so why do we want to lower the heart rate first? Because lowering the heart, uh, lowering the blood pressure first will cause a reflex tachycardia. So we have to control that heart rate before we lower their blood pressure. Once you, their heart rate's controlled, um, you know, once that heart rate's controlled, you have some, you know, you have to start lowering that blood pressure. Um, the most popular drug to do this is nicardipine. Uh, clofidipine is also gleaning popularity. It's just more expensive. Both are titratable calcium channel blockers. They both work really well. Um, they're both titratable. They're both relatively fast on and off. Um, so fentanyl, esmolol, some form of blood pressure lowering agent, usually an ICARD. Um, and that's kind of anti-impulse therapy in a nutshell. So now let's say that patient is hypotensive instead of hypertensive. What do we do then? Well, things like tamponade, MI, AV, uh, incapacitance, rupture, or incompetence, um, rupture, right? Those things would all be true treated appropriately, right? And it's kind of beyond the scope of this case. I will make a note specifically for tamponade. Um, normally, pericardial tamponade is treated with a pericardiosynthesis, right? Uh, there is controversy in treating um, aortic dissection with a pericardiosynthesis, right? Because they're actively hemorrhaging into that space, you're just going to keep pulling blood off of. The other flip side of that argument is that, well, if they're actively hemorrhaging in that space, we're going to need to have to pull blood off of it. So there's kind of a lose-lose situation here. Some places will say, uh, don't do a pericardiosynthesis if you think a tamponade is caused by a dissection. Others will say, if it's the thing, if you have no surgical ability at your hospital or in your field and you have to do it, do it. Ideally, they would just go to the OR and you wouldn't have to. But beyond that, kind of beyond the scope of the case. Uh, so, at the end of the day, John was given Esmol for his heart rate of less than 60, Nicarb, real blood pressure less than 120. He was taken into emergency surgery where he underwent a surgical repair of his aorta. Uh, he did well after surgery. Uh, he had a really long recovery. Um, he had a few hiccups, um, but he was discharged ultimately from the hospital about one and a half months later. Uh, and he's still alive today. So, there you go. Thanks for checking out the case. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments and I'll try to respond there. Uh, until next time, thanks for watching.